Well, good morning once again. And it's been a, a bit, kind of a strange week for me. It, it felt good and weird all at the same time being gone all week. Um, most of you know we went up to Big Bear. And uh, Marion and I and Marion's parents, who are both in their mid-80s, uh, went with us. And then our 14-year-old, who is the, the, the quietest 14-year-old you would ever see on the planet. So needless to say that everything went kind of slowly because they only walk so fast or so far. And, um, and then everything was quiet. You know, it's funny because they are so quiet sensitive. You know, if there was something on the radio, it's like, ah. Oh. And if we were in a restaurant and someone came in who was loud, you know, they would react. And it's just like they just really are used to silence in their place. And it was interesting because in retrospect, it was exactly what I needed. And I went up there bound and determined to practice what I preach. Imagine that. I'm going to try to practice what I preach, which meant I was going to try to be as present as I possibly could. I was going to just go slowly. I was going to really be present and appreciate things and see them. This was my goal going up there, that I was going to be there. And um, everything helped. Just the, uh, the natural beauty of the place, the weather was absolutely it's perfect. It couldn't have been any better if you ordered it from a menu. You know, low 70s, clear, dry, breezes. It was just absolutely perfect. And uh, I came up there armed with books and cigars. <laughs> All right? <laughs> now, if, if you think cigars are kind of weird because you got the usual ATF thing going in evangelical, evangelical Christianity, you know, uh, that we're not supposed to do. But it's a tradition with my father-in-law. He is a cigar smoker from way back, and when his wife got religion and stopped smoking, then she disallowed him from buying cigars as well. But it's okay if I do, you see. And so he looks forward to whenever we get together, because typically I'll come up with at least a couple, and this time I came up with four nice ones, fresh ones that I just bought. And we had a chance to sit on the, on the deck, you know, kind of almost like a tree house. There's trees all around us. And then the, the distant, uh, the other side of the valley, Big Bear Valley across the lake. Couldn't see the lake from where we were, but you could see the mountains rising up on the other side in the distance. And we're just sitting out there, you know, in this sunshine, in this breeze, making our clouds of aromatic smoke. <laughs> and as my uh, mother-in-law gave me kind of one of those disapproving glances because it blew over in her direction, I had to explain to her the whole theory behind a cigar. You know, you light a cigar and you're lighting a fuse. And that fuse is going to burn for about 45 minutes if you've got a decent cigar. And while that fuse is burning, you can't do anything else. You've got to be there. You've got to tend it. You've got to just be present and watch that thing burn down and just enjoy it. And then the conversation that ensued or whatever. But it was that kind of week. Wherever we went, it was just kind of low-key and almost slow motion. I read an entire book, Fahrenheit 451. Yeah, I've been wanting to get to because I hadn't read it in decades. And then I got through the first six chapters of The Grapes of Wrath and read some of the finest prose ever penned in the English language. Just an amazing... And it was just that kind of week. And it was just wonderful to just sit and to be. And I didn't, I tried not to isolate. You know, if I was reading off reading and then the uh, uh, Marion and her parents would gather around the table, I'd put my book down and go join and join into the conversation and just listen. Marion and I took a couple of walks. You might have seen the picture of our shadows uh, at Facebook. Just, just walking through and, and smelling things. The pine, you could smell the pine. You could smell rosemary. There are other herbs growing wild along the side of the road, and you could smell that. And chipmunks were running all over the place. Never saw a squirrel, but chipmunks. If you ever watch a chipmunk, it is so interesting. They got these long, bushy tails that move like this, but the rest of their bodies jerk like a bird. It was just the weirdest thing to watch the tail all smooth and the body going, you know. But they're the cutest little things. And then we got to be serenaded by coyotes in the distance, and these coyotes' packs just went off. And it was just amazing. This was the kind of thing that was, was going on. And it was just, <sighs> just taking this breath. And yeah, I was aware that all the things that stress me and all the things that are still wrong and imperfect and, and things that I have to deal with were down the mountain. I was aware of it. It was there in the back of my mind. But at that moment, it was okay. At that moment, I was just there. 
And I don't know if you can relate. I hope you can, that you've had moments where everything kind of gets stripped down. All the noise, the usual distractions, the, the things that are going on in your life just kind of get turned down. And then the question becomes, what's left? You know? It's that 2 a.m. in the morning experience when you wake up in the dark and it's just like, who am I? What am I doing? What's going on? You know, those, those kind of questions of meaning start to pop up when everything else turns down. Psychologically, I think we keep ourselves busy, we keep ourselves cluttered, we keep the noise level high so that we don't have to deal with those kinds of deep questions, existential questions. What is the meaning of life? You know, it's, it's like a joke, right? It's like an ongoing universal joke. What's the meaning of life? Because, you know, if it could have been answered, I suppose it would have by now, you know, with 10,000 years of human experience as we know it, and we still haven't answered the question. What's the meaning of life? But more importantly, what's the meaning of your life? What's the meaning of my life? And at times like this where everything gets quiet, those questions kind of bubble up to the surface, you know, like those bubbles in the geysers at Yellowstone. They just kind of bubble up, and there they are. And you got to deal with them. I suppose you don't, but it's nice to let this kind of stuff just sort of wash over, you know? What is the meaning of life? Well, you know, it may depend on where you ask. If I ask you that here like I am right now, then if you are actually responding, which I'm not letting you do, but if I did, you would probably respond in a more religious way or maybe a philosophical way. And you would try to come up with or you would formulate your thoughts in that religious vocabulary with those kind of ideas, more abstract, more theoretical, more theological. But if I asked you at work the same question, maybe you would answer in more of a practical way, more of a missional way. Maybe the meaning of life would be about something that you could do, a cause, something that you could change, some mark that you could make. If I asked you at home, maybe you would answer more relationally. It has to do with family. It has to do with the connection between us. You know, it seems like the question changes form. The question changes with its context. What is the meaning of our lives? How does that work? You know, if you think, think of a big bear moment that you've had. Think of a time when everything kind of got turned down. Maybe it was a vacation like that, where you're just on the beach or you're in the mountains. Maybe it was a camping trip, same thing, where everything is kind of stripped away and quiet and you can see the stars. What were you thinking about then? Where did it go then? Maybe it was a power outage. I like that one. You ever had a power outage that lasted a few hours and suddenly you can't turn anything on? There's no internet. <laughs> you're going crazy. There's no internet. You know, there's no television. There's no radio. There's none of the things. We can't even turn on a light, you know? What happens then? What do you resort to then in terms of the way that you handle that period of time? Everything's stripped down, slowed down. What if just your phone dies, you know? How do you deal with that? Now, we can be really stressed, we can be really angry, and we can be screaming around trying to get the power restored, trying to get this, trying to get that, or maybe we can just push off and just relax and enjoy this particular ride. See what this experience has to offer. What we're speaking of here in these moments that I'm hoping that you all have some resonance with, an example of this right on the tip of your mind, is sort of a forced con contemplative experience. Contemplation is actively cultivating being able to quiet down, let go, clear out, and find that space where it's just you connected to whatever is present in that particular moment. These moments are ones that bring that to the fore if we allow them to. I think that this really is the key of the contemplative life. It's just continuing to show up, continuing to allow yourself to be stripped down until all the meaning that you understand about life in general and your life in particular is found in and only in the moment that you're in, not anywhere else. Because as I was asking you that question, what's the meaning of life in all these different contexts? What's the meaning of your life? If your answer 
<laughs> First of all, if you answered in words, you've already missed the point, right? But if you answered in words in any way that pointed somewhere outside of this particular moment, the experience that you're having right now, then it's not the meaning that Jesus is talking about. Think of it this way. When Jesus said, you know, the kingdom of God isn't out there somewhere where you can find by observation. You're not going to say, hey, look, there it is, here it is. The kingdom of God is within you, in your midst, among you. It's the same thing. Kingdom to Jesus is the meaning of life. Kingdom to Jesus is everything that this life is about. And you're not going to find it outside of this moment. As soon as we put an answer in words, as soon as we symbolize it in language, we've already stepped away from anything that meaning could be. Meaning can't be described. It can't be defined. It can't be put into words. Now, you can say, well, isn't that what I'm trying to do right now? I'm trying to put it in words. Well, yeah and no. What I'm trying to do is use words to point to the fact that meaning is going to be known by you to the extent that you learn to find it right here, right now, in the flow of this moment. Not trying to harness anything, not trying to corral it, control it in any way, just experiencing the flow. That's what I got to do this week, was just slow down and experience what was right in front of me. To see, to smell, to taste, everything that was right in front of me. And just let that be enough. There was nothing else that needed to be added. There was no thing that I needed to accomplish in order to. It was just what was here, what was going on. Ultimately, meaning is not objective. It's not out there that we can see and describe. Meaning is subjective. Now, that sounds like I'm saying meaning is relative. No, meaning is still tied to something that is deep truth, that I believe is deep truth that stands outside ourselves, but it's always rooted in this unity of all things. It's rooted in God's presence in all things. And the only way that we're going to experience, sense the truth of that meaning, the reality of that meaning, the import of that meaning, is when we're just present to it, just letting it go. This is what Jesus is trying to talk about when he gives us all of the stories, all of the images. So let's take an example. And since we're still kind of shadowing what we're doing on Wednesday night with Khalil Gibran, um, let's, let's go with that. Because a couple of weeks ago, we read his essay on giving. And I think giving is a perfect place for us to take a look and see how this works. Because the ethic of giving, the ethic of generosity in Christianity is huge. You know, it just towers above everything. We understand that part of being Christian or maybe the, the hallmark of being a Christian, is that we're generous, that we're a giving people, that we, we supply these things. And so this is probably a perfect moment for me to do a tithing message now, isn't it? <laughs> you could say this whole last 10 minutes was just a wind-up to do a tithing message. No, I'm not going to go there. I wouldn't do that to you. you know. This idea of giving, we need to take a look at from that other perspective, the same way that we're trying to look at meaning from another perspective. Instead of it being an objective thing out there that we need to do or fulfill, it's something intrinsic to ourselves. It's just who we are or part of this moment. So the same thing with giving. Let me ask it this way to you. Does God care if we give? Think about that for a second. Does God care if we give anything at all? Did God command us to give? Did God define what we're supposed to give? Now, the knee-jerk reaction to that is yes, yes, and 10%, right? Yes, we're, God, we're supposed to give. God cares. He commanded us to give, and we're supposed to give 10%. That's what the tithe is all about. But let's break that down. Let's move back. And instead of just a knee-jerk reaction, if giving is a rule, if God commanded us to give, then giving becomes an obligation. Right? If we're commanded to give, it's a rule, then it's an obligation. If God told us 10%, as soon as we attach an amount to our giving, what does it become? A tax. If it's a commandment, it's an obligation. 
if we, if we attach a, a, an amount to it, then it's a tax. And if we're expecting anything in return, then it's a transaction. And so we got to be really careful with what we think about giving and the normal way that we think about it. Because I guarantee you, 95, 8 plus percent of the giving is either a tax and obligation or it's a transaction. It's not giving in the way that Jesus understood giving, in the way that he was trying to understand, help us to understand what giving is all about. I don't believe that God cares about our gifts, but I believe he cares deeply about the giver and the receiver and the connection between the two. That's what he's interested in. He's interested in the meaning that passes between giver and receiver in that moment of flow between them. That's what he's trying to get at. He's trying to get us to a place that allows a flow to happen, an experience to happen, a connection to happen that will look like giving but won't be the motivation that we normally have to make the transaction, if that makes any sense. I think that there are attributes to giving. There are ways that we can start to take a look at. If we take giving that Jesus is talking about and start to move it around and take a look at it from different sides, we can see certain attributes that maybe can help us to dial in. Remember, the words are just pointers to try to get us closer and closer to what this is all about and what this looks like in our lives. And so I want to use this, this little prose poem by Khalil Gibran and see if that can help us get to the place. But it's going to connect with Jesus' words at every turn. In fact, on the uh, handout, I list Matthew 5, verses 38 to 48, as a, a great place for you to look up and see Jesus talking about different attributes of giving. But let's see what Khalil has to say, because he has a way of putting things that can help us lock in and see if we can get more illumination about what Jesus is talking about. So a rich man says to the prophet, speak to us of giving. And this is the people of the city that he's leaving, stopping him at the seashore and saying, give us some of your wisdom before you go. So teach us about giving. And he says, you give but little when you give of your possessions. It's when you give of yourself that you truly give. I think this is the first attribute of giving. It's intimate. I love the saying by Mother Teresa who said that it's easier to give a cup of rice to someone halfway around the world than to just deal with and love the person who lives in your own home. It is so much easier to give an impersonal gift, to write a check, to send something in the mail, to give a credit card number, than it is to give of yourself. If you think about it, what is it that you really possess? The only thing that you possess, truly possess, is your presence. Presence is all we've got. And the only way that presence manifests itself in, in our lives is through time. And so time is a measure of our presence. Where we put our time and really bring our presence to is giving of ourself and however we do it. I always think that money are just, is just time credits, right? You give your time to someone, they give you a time credit. Then you can give that time credit to somebody else, and they'll give you a product that came out of their time. And there it goes. It's all we're doing is trading time back and forth and back and forth, and we have this little currency of some sort that are the time credits. Giving our time, giving ourselves, that is the most precious thing that we can do because it's all we really are. It's all we really have. Every other possession that we have is really illusion. It's really not ours. And this is where he goes in the second area. For what are your possessions but things you keep and guard for fear you may need them tomorrow? And tomorrow, what shall tomorrow bring to the overprudent dog burying bones in the trackless sand as he follows the pilgrims to the holy city? Isn't that a great image? You all watch your dog bury a bone, and if they're anything like my dogs, they bury the bone, and then they forget where they buried it. And it's there forever until you re-landscape or something. But for a dog burying the bone in trackless sand on the way to the holy city, how is that ever going to be revisited? It's just as fruitless, he's saying, as what we typically do. And what is fear of need but need itself? 
And is not dread of thirst when your well is full? Thirst that is unquenchable? How many of us worry about things that are not present? We got food on the table, we got money in the bank, and yet we're still worried? How in the world do you slake that kind of thirst when it's not real? It's just in your head. But this idea that the possessions are not really ours, the idea that there is a flow to life is the second attribute of giving, that it is fearless, that you are unafraid to let your resources flow to someone in need. You're not trying to hoard. You're not trying to dam up and withhold because you're afraid that tomorrow you may not have enough. There's a fearless quality. Intimacy, fearlessness. And then there's an unselfconscious quality that Jesus is trying to get across. And the way Gibran puts it is there are those who give little of the much which they have. And they give it for recognition, and their hidden desire makes their gifts unwholesome. We talked about this in terms of love. Is love behavior? No, because so often we can do loving behavior for an ulterior motive, for some sort of gain for ourselves. And we talked about if we give with any idea of return, any idea of increasing our standing in someone else's eyes, then it's a transaction. It's no longer a gift. It's a quid pro quo. There's something else going on. And there are those who have little and give it all. These are the believers in life and the bounty of life, the fearless ones, and their coffer is never empty. There are those who give with joy, and that joy is their reward, and there are those who give with pain, and that pain is their baptism. And there are those who give and know not pain in giving, nor do they seek joy, nor give with mindfulness of virtue. They give as in yonder valley the myrtle breathes its fragrance into space. Through the hands of such as these, God speaks. And from behind their eyes, he smiles upon the earth. This idea of being able to give as unselfconsciously as the tree emits its fragrance. How did Jesus put it? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, didn't he? It's just need an automatic flow. This is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about losing your life in order to find it, just letting all that go, not be concerned, not be calculating, thinking about things. But the tree just does what the tree does. Can we do the same thing? Just do what we do because of who we have become and see with that fearless quality, not worrying. How did Jesus put that in terms of fearlessness? He said, don't store up your treasures on earth where moth is going to eat and rust is going to destroy. Store it in heaven where it's safe. That fearless kind of idea that there's always going to be abundance flowing through. Don't worry about tomorrow, Jesus said. Tomorrow has enough troubles of its own. Tomorrow's going to take care of itself. Be like these birds. Be like these flowers who are just present to this moment right here and right now. Unselfconscious, intimate, intimate. Jesus said there's no greater love than someone lay down their life for their friend. And we think that means physical death, but no, it means laying down that egoic experience, laying down our own agendas and just being present to and being open to what flows as a result of a connection that we're having. Intimate, fearless, unselfconscious, and now present. Has to be present. He says, it is well to give when asked, but it's better to give unasked, though through understanding. And to the open-handed, the search for one who shall receive is joy greater than giving. That's an interesting line. To the open-handed, the search for one who shall receive is joy greater than giving. In other words, the connection itself is the gift. What passes between is inconsequential. It's commentary. It's the connection. It's the presence. And is there aught that you would withhold? All you have shall someday be given. Therefore, give it now, so that the season of giving may be yours and not your inheritors. This is, this is all so practical. Everything that you have, these possessions that you think that you own, but you really don't, 
You're just stewards for a while, right? And when you die, everything is going to be given. Do you want to direct that gift? Do you want the IRS, the probate court to do it? Do you want your inheritors to do it? Who is going to direct this flow? And not even direct the flow, but just let it flow, rather than holding on to it for what? There's that great story that Jesus tells where this man has a few really good bumper crops, and he says, what am I going to do with all this surplus? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'm going to just tear down my barns, and I'm going to build bigger barns and, barns and bigger silos, and I'm going to store all this stuff up, and he does all that, and he does all that work, and then he sits at home, and he says, ah, I'm set now for years and years to come, and God says, you fool, tonight your life is required of you. Now, where does all this go? Now, who directs all of this? Presence, present. The giving is here. It's now. It's part of the flow. It doesn't have agenda that bleeds over into some other moment or context. Giving, according to Jesus, is unconditional. You often say, I would give, but only to the deserving. Ooh. The trees in your orchard say not so, nor the flocks in your pasture. They give that they may live, for, with to, for to withhold is to perish. Think about that for a second. The trees, they give in order to live, because to withhold is to perish. What's the life cycle of the tree? In the fall, they drop their leaves. Those leaves go into the ground. They create the compost. They create the fertility of the soil. The flowers come up. The fruit comes up, and then it falls, and it has seeds that create the next cycle of life. To withhold is to already be dead. The natural life cycle is continue to flow, to give, to have more come through, and to give that, and to just let it be a part of who you are, as natural as breathing. Not to exhale is to die, right? <sighs> give your breath back and take the next one, and let the next one go. Give it, take, and give. This is what Jesus was talking about so often. In the prodigal son, the father says to the older son, everything I have is yours. Always been yours. There's never been a time that it wasn't yours. Everything I have is yours. This is that unconditional quality. Jesus says, yeah, it's all well and good when you love those who love you back, but how about loving the enemy, the one that you have judged unworthy, undeserving, the one that you think is not even in the ballpark of being in line to get anything from you? That's the one that you love. That's the one that you give to. Surely, he who is worthy to receive his days and nights is worthy of all else from you. If he's there breathing, if the sun is falling on him, if the rain is falling on him, Jesus says, God sees everything as equal. The sun and the rain fall on the just and the unjust alike. If someone is before you, breathe in air. If they're worthy of their days and their nights, they're certainly worthy of something from you. And he who has deserved to drink from the ocean of life deserves to fill his cup from your little stream great images here. All I have is yours. It is so hard for us to understand the immensity of that statement. And the only place that that can take us is to humility. And this sixth quality of giving is to be humble. The way Jerome puts it, what desert is greater? What desert greater shall there be than that which lies in the courage and the confidence, nay, the charity of receiving. That's a difficult line, but look what he's saying. What desert greater shall there be than that which lies in the courage and the confidence, nay, the charity of receiving? The desert is a place where everything is stripped to its bare essentials. It looks empty. But to strip down to that place and realize that you have the courage and the confidence and the charity to receive, 
That is the humble state. That is humility defined. What is humility really? What is humility all about? To be humble. To be humble is to see you as you really are, to see yourself as you really are, to see that we are receivers first and foremost. Anything that we have to give is only because we received it first. Leonard Sweet has a great way of putting this. He says, you know, we all really have a God complex. We like to be givers and not receivers. Why? Because the giver is in the superior position. The giver is the one who has at least the illusion of control. I've got resources. I've got stuff. I can decide where it goes. I can decide who's deserving or who's not. That's God's position. We like that position. How hard for us is it to simply receive? When you get a compliment, how hard is it for you to just say, thank you? Do you try to minimize it? Do you try to move around? Oh, you know, it's not me. It's the Lord. No, we do these things. Why is it so hard for us to just receive and say thank you? Because it's so hard for us to be humble. It's so hard for us to see that in the final analysis, we are completely dependent on everything. We don't really own anything except our presence. Our next breath is not guaranteed to us. That is too frightening a place for most of us to be, that place of humility. That's the desert. But if we can have that courage, that confidence, and even that love to understand who we really are, then this whole cycle can commence. We can freely receive, as Jesus says, freely you have received, now freely give. Same idea. But we have to acknowledge that we have freely received. Not that we earned it, not that we're entitled, and someone else has to earn and become entitled before we let flow. No. Once we realize how freely we have received, then the humility allows us to freely give. And who are you that men should rend their bosom and unveil their pride, that you may see their worth naked and their pride unabashed? See first that you yourself deserve to be a giver, an instrument of giving. For in truth, it is life that gives unto life, while you who deem yourself a giver are but a witness. What's our key scripture here that we say over and over, at least I say it over and over again? You know. We love because he first loved us. What is it that we really own that is ours? Everything we have was given to us. Even our presence, which is the only thing we really possess, it was given to us. This life, this love, everything was given to us. To receive that, to understand that, to take that in and make that the basis of who we are, that kind of humility is something so few of us can actually live with. That amount of uncontrollability, that amount of uncertainty, to just throw ourselves on the lap of our God and say, I trust you. This is going to continue. This breath can continue. And then he finishes with, and you receivers, and you are all receivers. That's kind of like we're saying, hey, everybody's recovering from something. Everybody's receiving here. You receivers, and you are all receivers. Assume no weight of gratitude. Huh? Assume no weight of gratitude? How wait, what, what, Lest you lay a yoke upon yourself and upon him who gives. Rather, rise together with the giver on his gifts as on wings. For to be over-mindful of your debt is to doubt his generosity, who has the free-hearted earth for mother and God for father. You know, at first blush, this sounds so wrong. What is he saying? Assume no weight of gratitude? You finally got to the point where you're willing to be a receiver, but you're not going to feel grateful for it? Oh, that's, he's using some hyperbole there. What's he talking about? He's saying, to be over-mindful of the debt is to bring the pride back into the situation, isn't it? I should be above this. I should not have this debt. But as soon as you do that, you're negating the generosity of the giver, and you're bringing yourself back out of this cycle, this free cycle. Freely who have received, now freely give. We're not doing that anymore, even in the negative as well as the positive. Can we just stay with the flow? Can we just stay with the cycle? 
Freely you have received, freely give. These are these attributes of giving that I think are so essential for us to understand. That giving the way Jesus talks about giving, this, this state of being, this state of being in flow with spirit and with everything around us is intimate, it's fearless, it's unselfconscious, it's present, it's unconditional, and it's humble. Take a look at those six. Think about them for a second. Look at them because I believe that they are also the attributes of meaning and meaning of life, meaning of our lives. There is no sense of meaning that we can attain in this life that is not intimate and fearless and unselfconscious and present and unconditional and humble. The meaning of life that Jesus is talking about, the experience of kingdom that Jesus is talking about, is a moment in which all these things are present, a moment in which we've just allowed ourselves to be unselfconsciously aware. And this moment of meaning is all of these at the same time. This is why I believe that God doesn't care about our gifts. He's not commanding us to give. But he knows when we have that sense of meaning, when we have the sense of having entered kingdom, right? We can't be separated from the moment of connection, which is part of this flow. The gift will ensue. Whatever it is, it may be non-physical, it may be non-material. The connection itself is the real gift. The transaction is just commentary. It's just what happens. But to allow yourself to move into this moment, the meaning won't be separated from the giving or from the moment of connection. We love because he first loved us. This is what he's trying to get across to us. It is taking life and turning it around and looking at it from a completely different side and seeing that it's not the outward things that we do that sanctify. It's the connection inside that flows outward that comes from the sacred ground. This is the deep, deep truth Jesus is trying to get across to us. And meaning and giving and love and redemption and salvation and forgiveness all of these things are of the same piece. They're all different, just different ways of saying the same thing. Part of this relationship that we have with each other and our God. To experience them is to experience them this way. There was one morning that I got up before dawn, up in the mountains, up in Big Bear. And I got up and I made myself a cup of coffee and it was still dark and everyone was still asleep. And I went out onto the balcony, and I'm just standing there with my steaming coffee. And I'm looking out. The trees are right there, the distant mountains on the other side of the lake. And I'm watching it just lighten until finally the sun crests, and then you have that golden light on the leaves and the way it's playing across at that steep angle. And just watching and being this aware of this whole ball turning with me on it. You know, it's just it's amazing how fast it moves if you pay attention, isn't it? Have you ever just sat and watched the light change, how the shadows move across your room? If you just give them 15 or 20 minutes, they're not where they were. How fast we're turning if you just be aware of the quality of the light and where the light is going. And I'm just sitting there. That coffee tasted great. The air was perfect. You know, it was just all there. Everything felt right. Everything felt in its place. Even though none of my circumstances had changed, there I was. How did that happen? How did I find a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, just standing there drinking a cup of coffee and doing absolutely nothing? Nothing I'm trained to do, nothing I've been working toward. I'm just standing there being completely unproductive and feeling more meaning more sense of place and purpose than I normally do in any given work week. I gave myself to that place. I gave my time to that moment. I gave myself to the members of my family 
It was intimate, fearless, unselfconscious, present, unconditional. And just this humble knowing that I didn't create any of this, but it's all there for me, and I can just breathe it in. The meaning became real for that moment. And then the next moment, it's gone again. Why? Because I withheld. I went back into a defensive crouch. I started worrying again. But here's the catch. And here, not the catch. Here's the key to it all. I now know where to look for meaning, for salvation, for connection, for forgiveness, for deliverance. And if I found it once, I can find it again. And if I miss it in this moment, there's another moment coming around the corner, and I can pick it up like the next bus and ride that thing. Meaning exists for the moment in which you find it, and you will only find it in the moment in which you are living right now. It doesn't last. It doesn't keep like the manna. You can't bottle it. You must become present to it every single moment. And if that sounds like a lot of work at first, yeah, but you get better and better at it. And the good news is you can't lose it. You can only become unaware of it and then present to it again. That is the meaning of life that can't be put into words, but is so real if you'll just let it be. Let's pray. Father, the truth is you are meaning. Meaning is your person, your spirit, your being that we can connect with always right here and right now. So, Father, help us to connect to you, to find the meaning in you, to find the provision in you, to find the humility in our relationship with you that we are de your dependent receivers and you are our giver, our provider, and that that is a beautiful place to be in submission to everything that you are, which will never feel like a restriction, but always a liberation, a liberation in submission to you. That's where we want to be, Father. Help us to do that more and more and more. Find our moments, give ourselves completely to them, and in that moment, realize what this is all about. Your love, your direction, your guidance, your provision. Thank you, Father. Never let us forget that we can only give, we can only love, because you did first. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all stand.